I can't tell you how excited I am to be here today in front of you all for what you mean to the world and the power that you have. My background is being a product manager and working with designers and developers to make that wow product that gets people to go, oh my goodness. The power that all of you have in your minds is incredible. Raise your hand if you are a designer. Okay, now raise your hand if you consider yourself a founder. Okay, so we've got a 50-50 split of both founders and designers, which is fantastic. That's the mix that I wanted to have today. So as we think about today where we are, does anyone know what year the first cell phone was created? Any guess? Earlier. Close. It's 1973. Does anyone know the year the iPhone was launched? Yes. So it took 44 years to get to that point to have that amazing innovation. In Italy, the Duomo that was designed in Florence, that took 72 years to build. The designer of that died before it was done. The power of what you have as designers is something that you think of and create can be available tomorrow. I can't think of a more powerful audience than all of you. I'm, I'm wild and excited to be here. Today is not about me. It's about our incredible panel and what they bring to the table. So designing with resilience is absolutely incredible. And as I think about that, and my slide's not advancing. Perfect. So at first I'm gonna introduce Prisca Pan. She is the senior UX uh, design leader at Apple, and her background is working at really incredible companies in addition to Apple. She's worked at Salesforce as well as eBay and brings an incredible perspective to today's panel. I'm super excited to have her. And uh, we also have Joe Peters from AspenX. Now, AspenX is a new brand that you've maybe never heard of at all. AspenX is part of Aspen One, and Aspen Skiing Company is part of Aspen One. He's representing a brand new brand that expands the value of the outdoor experience and brings it out in a way that is not just a luxurious experience, but a really memorable one. And then lastly, we sorry, this is a little slow. So we've got Billy Sweetman, the head of design at Headway. Headway is in Wisconsin, and uh, our team is here. And Billy's focus is 100% on before a product is even created and designed and put out there, validating that it is 100% what the market is looking for, such that once it's released, people say, oh my gosh, that's a wow. Just like the wow when the iPhone came out. People lined up around the block, they were camping, and there was a huge back order. That's what you want when you, when you release something, is some people don't even need to hear the sales and marketing. They're already committed, they're already part of it. So just a little bit more background on me. Has anyone here ever had a mentor that's helped them start something new and get a new job? Raise of hands. Mentors are one of the most powerful things that we have. I remember wanting to be a product manager for medical devices, and I was up against nurses to get this job. The CEO of the company looked at me and my background and said, you're not a product manager, you're not a nurse, you are a designer and a future CEO. I like the way you think. So he hired me. As I was going along in my career, I had an opportunity to do a business development par partnership for three different products. And he said, you can only do one. I looked at it and thought about it and I said, oh my gosh, this one here has the ability and the power to save lives and send people home cancer free. That was the one that I picked. Fast forward to last year in February, 
he was diagnosed, the guy's name is Dennis, he was diagnosed with stage four brain cancer. And unfortunately, he passed really quickly. But without him being my mentor and voting to bring me on, I wouldn't have had this chance to stand in front of you today and be able to say, I worked with incredible designers and incredible developers to make something that would help send someone home cancer free. I know in all of you, there's an incredible idea, a set of ideas and visions that you want to have happen. And that's why we have this panel here today is to talk about design resilience so that you as designers or founders can find a way to push through, get those mentors, get those resources to launch that one thing that will make that wow that you all have, the talents that are in you. So as I think about that, just recently, an opportunity, someone called us and said, we have a platform that will basically cure uncurable brain cancer. So I now have an opportunity, we have an opportunity to pay that forward and help actually cure a disease that has historically been uncurable. So before I continue any further, I'd like everyone to stand up and take a selfie of yourself uh, with us as a background. And if you can uh, tag us, tag Headway on social, that'd be great. So if everyone could stand up, and an opportunity for you to pull out your phone, show that your, to your friends that you are here, show your friends on social. And we will be giving out $200 to one person that posts this and tags it to Headway. So this picture is now worth $200 at least, but if you just did it in a few seconds, that's well over $1,000 for a few seconds. So now you're incredible uh, photographers. What a career. Now, this is the last moment while I'm holding this microphone and while I'm talking that I'm going to actually say the word headway. If I say it again, at all. I'm going to pay you $200 if you hear me say it again. Okay, so whoever calls me out, that's yours. It's going to be tricky. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is focus in on some key questions that really pull out the idea of design resilience and take it from real thought leaders that have done this day in and day out that have incredible careers that I'm just in awe of. The design thinking that they have, the ability to think about something and make it happen and do it in a way that is just art and it's beautiful, it, it's amazing. So I'm going to ask uh, questions of the panel and at the end I'll leave time for you to ask questions and there's also opportunities to meet with us afterwards, and there's also a social event uh, tomorrow. So this isn't your only chance to have conversations. This is your starting point. So Joe, I kind of wanted to ask you first, um, what's an example of a time for you when design thinking just made all the difference for the experience that you wanted to have happen? And I know it's a, it's a history of a lot of products, so what, what would you pull out? This is one, okay, we're good, we're good on volume. All right, uh, great question, Mark. Um, there are so many examples. I will take a current example, a uh, little bit of context. I started at Aspidax at the end of June. So it's new startup and then I'm new with the startup, um, but I would say it came very recently when we started to think about the products that we're making, future apparel. Um, it, occurred to me rather quickly that we did not know anything about the consumer. Um, and it showed in the products that we were making. So we needed to really take a step back and think about who we were making this stuff for. And it, you know, as product designers, I'm that bad guy that came in and said like, I'm so sorry, but we're not gonna make any of this. Um, because it's not right. And we know it's not right because it's not for anyone. We need to, my team, marketing, needs to figure out via qualitative and quantitative research what the consumer base looks like, and those will be key inputs 
that will come out in beautiful apparel, beautiful products, experiences. But right now, we gotta wait. And that's a really, really difficult thing to do. Um, so I think, you know, when we think about resiliency, I mean, it, it applies to all areas of that design process. I think sometimes it means stopping and potentially pivoting, at times maybe starting over. Um, but I think with the end game in mind, knowing the consumer base is just so, so critical to any product that you're gonna design. Thank you, Joe. And Billy, how would you sort of characterize that in your experience of just a time when design thinking made all the difference? Yeah, we work. Is my mic on? No. No. How about now? Still not here? Testing, testing, testing. All right, we'll use this one. Um, I remember we worked on a digital transformation for a logistics uh, company. Uh, they had all these customer service reps, like, I think it was like 25 customer service reps who had to work with all of the suppliers and all the companies are actually doing the shipments and things like that. And we had to work through um, this rules system because all of these companies had different specific rules that they needed within the system. And uh, none of the customer service reps could do it. It all had to be programmed by developers in the back end by hand and this was changing daily. So valuable resources, developers not making new products, not helping uh, tune things up where it needed to be done. They were all doing that. So we sat down, we talked to all the customer service reps, and we initially had this idea, we're gonna build this amazing rules system. Uh, it's gonna be visual, we were inspired by a node graph uh, system, and it's gonna be, uh, you can step through the rules and you can see how it's all done. But after spending, I think, maybe two weeks of interviews, just talking to customers, or talking to the customer service reps, we're like, this is not how they think. They don't think this way. They think through emails. They're spending a lot of time just writing messages. When a, a rule comes in from somebody, it's not, oh, if this, then that. It's, hey, I need these to be, I need half of these to come over here. And so building off of the node graph system we built, we ended up building and really thinking about, could we get this as easy as an email? Uh, and working with the dev team, we built a conversational UI out that they could just type in the rules as they needed to. Um, it would prompt them to fill out the next expression, things like that, and it looked like an email. So the idea was that somebody could send them a message, they could kind of copy and paste that and put that in there. But, I mean, like you were saying, just spending that time talking to them, really understanding what they're thinking. You know, we thought we had the solution in mind, we thought it was really streamlined, um, but after spending that time with them, you know, it really turned, uh, sort of gave this like turnkey moment where we're like, oh yes, this is this is what we need to do. Um, and it was great because then we delivered it to them, to them and we got their entire dev team uh, out from writing rules, which now they could focus on new feature development, which was a huge boom for their biz business. So. Thanks, Billy. So Prisco, what would be an example of uh, something you worked on where design thinking was this that magic that made it happen? Yeah. Um, sorry. <laughs> well, I'll be using your mic. Um, yeah, I think one moment that stood out to me was when I was designing uh, the Dreamforce app for Salesforce in 2015, I want to say, and. Um, when I took a look at the years, the previous year's app, it was very clear that the focus was uh, function over experience. And so in that time, I, I felt like, okay, uh, there's, there's a lot of ways for me to improve on this experience by focusing on the look and field, et, ce et cetera. But it wasn't until after, you know, we've spoken to users and uh, some major stakeholders of the event that, uh, it got clear to me that the app is really just a companion for the attendees at the event. And the main purpose was for the app to navigate the attendees uh, around the event and that really changed the way that I approached designing the solution. So I would say that was, um, that, that's something that sticks out to me till today. I love that. So Billy, I'm gonna kinda ask you like a big question. And this is something that I always like to ask people. So when you have conversations with me, know that this is the one thing I'm gonna ask you. What is that big legacy that you wanna get done 
in a year, maybe max five years, something that is an experience you want to create, something that you want to improve. Um, it's not like a business thing or a life thing. It's just the Billy thing. I think for, for me, um, you know, I've been mentoring a lot recently through ADP list and, and things like that, trying to help younger designers find their voice in the industry and really help them kind of guide some of their career paths. Uh, for me, it's like elevating designers positions at companies to not just be uh, sort of these feature mills or mock farms where it's like, just send it to the designer to get mocks. We're all doing the real work. Um, and help designers have those strategic conversations, get into the, I mean, they've earned the seat at the table, and currently they still have to kind of talk about why they're relevant and why their craft matters, but as, you know, design becomes, uh, our tools become more sophisticated, really helping us get more strategic, have conversations with product, have conversations with business owners. You know, maybe in the future, a uh, design is the first co-hire at a startup instead of a uh, tech founder. You know, that's usually everyone's like, oh, we need a technical founder first. In the next five years, it'd be great if it's like, no, we need a design hire first. You know, that's where we need to go. Um, and so, like, that's one thing that's really important to me is just elevating that conversation within the design community. Can you think of an example of a company that's really well known that's done that? Um, well, we were just talking uh, today a little bit about how Apple, you know, sometimes you don't have a product manager uh, on a team because design and development is handling those things, right? The design has that ownership and that responsibility. Um, and there's a lot of companies out there that are doing that in specific cases, mostly because it's needs-based. Uh, they might not have product on staff right now, but um, I think that's a really good example and, and something that we should strive for is to have more of that ownership and more responsibility as designers and developers. Okay, so Joe, what about you and, and your legacy? Thank you. Uh, legacy is a terrifying word to me. Uh, I think it kind of reads like I'm long gone well, no, I'm, I'm talking about in the next year or so, yeah. or five years. Okay. What's the icon? Yeah, the icon. Um, I would say I'm really out to evolve the Aspenex brand as a brand that stands for all the great parts about Aspen. Show of hands, how many people in the room have been to Aspen? A lot of you. Wow. I've only been there four times. Uh, <laughs> And I live in Minnesota. Uh, but I think we think about Aspen X, we think about X as a multiplier. And I think there's a, there's a unique opportunity for this brand to represent all the incredible things about this magical place and, and multiplying not the caviar or the champagne or cloud nine. Uh, those are certainly important parts of that experience, but I'm really looking to make sure that this brand multiplies the magic that is the area of Aspen, the air, the altitude, the water, the progression that we've seen from this community for a really, really long time. Um, how do we do that into apparel and experiences? It's TBD. Um, but I think it's really important to think about um, a unique value proposition from a brand that makes jackets in how we try to really think about culture and think about how we can have a point of view on behalf of a place that's really, really special. So that's what I'm out to do, I suppose. And Prisca, I know you like the word icon more than legacy. <laughs> how would you respond to that? Um, yeah, I think for myself personally, um, I am an aspiring founder. I don't know if you guys have caught Brian Chesky's sort of call out to designers that we need more founders in this space. And uh, I do think that there's an opportunity to um, really showcase what design can do for the company. Um, so the company that I'm trying to get off the ground. It's called Peer to Peer. Uh, it is a platform that democratizes job hunting and uh, hiring via peer to peer referrals. Um, if you think about it, the best way for you to get a job is actually when a friend of a friend who needs something and you happen to fit the bill. 
However, we don't utilize this channel enough today, primarily because it's a, it's a lot of work to refer somebody. You have to know if uh, they're available, if you have to know if they're compatible, uh, and the workflow for that currently is, I don't know about you guys, but is a bit of a hot mess. Uh, so what Peer-to-Peer -peer aims to do is to allow you to create a vouch list of people that you've worked with before, uh, whom you would want to work with again, and based on that, we take away the complexity of you referring someone and match them with relevant opportunities via your vouch list. Uh, so that is, that is uh, what I aspire to within the next one to five years. And why is that so important to you? Um, it's because for me, I actually have not submitted a resume since 2015. So all my jobs have come through warm referrals or a uh, friend of a friend. And I think as we all know with the macroeconomics that's going on today, uh, that is a channel that um, can help you get somewhere <laughs> besides you know, uh, throwing in a, a job application, a resume, uh, and, and, and I've seen a lot of my friends go through that, and I think that's why it's important. I, I feel like it's a time for a change on how we approach hiring and job hunting. Yeah, I definitely agree with that whole perspective, and we were talking about this before, that boiling it down to that small group of really trusted people that know you that you would want to work with again. I mean, it's typically the concept of who would you get into the trenches with and take another battle with, rather than, well, they're okay. Yeah. Because it's, it's, trust is one of those most important things. So this is completely different, actually, than what LinkedIn is all about. Absolutely. So Billy, how do you think about basically this whole challenge of design resilience when you see a project or an opportunity and perhaps like the founder or just the process of where things are at, you can kind of see it's honestly already a train wreck. Like how do you approach that like to avoid that situation? Well, if it's already a train wreck, don't tell the founder it's a train wreck because they're going to get really mad at you and then they're going to shut the door and not talk to you anymore. Um, so talk about that more. So, I mean, you just kind of come into it with an open mind and know that you're there to help, you're there to get things aligned. Um, you need to understand where they've been, what they've done, uh, sort of the trajectory they're currently on. And then, you know, it's just putting good processes in place to start making positive changes. Uh, so there's projects that, you know, as a designer, uh, we're digital design agencies, so I show up differently on projects all the time. Sometimes I'm more of a product owner role, but as a designer seat, so I'm helping designers. I'm writing user stories for designers, and I'm helping review work and run stand-ups and things like that. Other times I'm in the weeds helping systematize you know, the actual design work so that we can get design moving quicker. Um, so it's just really identifying what the problems are and trying to find the solutions in there in the best way possible. And sometimes there's non-negotiables, right? Founder has X amount of dollars, we can't do that. So how do we can be really scrappy? Um, how can we do it with the funding that they have? Um, I've seen a lot of uh, founders unfortunately get taken advantage of by uh, folks because they're like, well, we're gonna do this big robust design process and they burn out all their money and they don't have anything to show for it. Um, so it's really like figuring out what those key things are that we can execute on and help folks out um, and really try to set them up for success. Yeah, I like that because it's as if every dollar that the founder and the designer team has needs to be contributing toward good and value. One of the things that I often hear um, CTOs say is, I know how awful my my developers feel when they create something that's never, ever gonna get used. And how does that feel even at the design level when what you create also doesn't get there as well? I mean, how, Billy, in your experience, have you helped maybe get the, the I, would, I guess I would call it the cadence and the quality and the volume of something out 
for founders that are looking to kind of get to that scale point? Yeah, I think like, I mean, there's depending on where founders are with their in their journey and, and where they are with their company, there's different things that, that we've done or I've helped out with. Uh, you know, sometimes it is just helping their junior designers understand what the process is and how do we deliver things quickly, effectively, uh, that makes sense. Uh, how do we, we don't have to user test everything across the world. You know, there's things that Apple and Google have figured out that we can just borrow. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we can focus on the things that actually matter that are the differentiator and then we can make those things, uh, the things that matter. Uh, sometimes it's coming in and understanding like, hey, you're at a prime opportunity for a design system. Like nobody needs to design another button here right now. We need to elevate the the problem solving here uh, to be what you're actually trying to do. And that's not figuring out if an input field needs to have an error state. Like we, we've got that covered. So let's get that in place so that we can get your designers out of this sort of rework thing. Uh, so yeah, it's a it's little bit different, um, but a lot of it comes down to talking with the founders, really understanding where they're at. Um, where their journey has been and trying to identify how we can best serve serve them. Yeah, that's so helpful because it avoids that pain of the in the process of we're just not getting to the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. So for you, Joe, your background is um, outdoor tech, Red Wing shoes, Vask hiking shoes, and now you've got Aspen X. How do you think about a way of avoiding a major product launch problem, like just a problem that you want to avoid. And you're, you've been in a lot of situations where there's something new and now it's on you to, to wrestle it to the ground and make it right rather than just check the box and have it done. So many failed product launches. Talk uh, about that. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think when, when I look retrospect, the, the, the non-successes or failures. Um, I think back on them and I, I think it starts with the creative brief or the business brief that, you know, creative briefs are, are critically important, but when working with a founder or a president or a VP, I like to ask for business briefs that can then inform the creative brief because ultimately like marketing is no longer like the shiny toy aisle. Right, like we can, we can illustrate the fact we can drive business, we can drive leads, we can drive all these tangible things. So I think it's really helpful to get those inputs from the management, if you will, as to what they're looking to accomplish because that POV may be different than what we learned in business school. Um, so I think it's getting that clear brief and then the way I you know, think about the go-to-market process now is you know, in the early stages, there's no such thing as a bad idea, right? Like, let's let's get these going. Um, but there is a situation where I have to I have to call everyone to put their pencils down. Um, like, idea time is unfortunately concluded because we need to support this go to market, and it's going to be here in three months. Um, so there, I, I I put up really definitive timelines for the group to say, let's think creatively, let's whiteboard, let's go on hikes outside and get inspired. But in three weeks, we have to align on a concept. And once we align on said concept, like all the energy needs to go into that uh, because we have to, we have to launch this thing. So as much as I don't want to be the person that like, you know, harshes the creative buzz, oftentimes I have to be. Um, but my goal is to give as much time as possible for that incubation period of really, really awesome ideas, gain alignment, and then we go make it. And I think in past experiences, that didn't happen. Because we were, we were ideating against a launch that was happening in three days, and that just doesn't work. We needed to land that idea three months. So step number one, buy a time machine. That's one of my favorite lines. <laughs> buy a time machine, go back. Uh, but I think you just gotta, you gotta lock in pencils down, be creative, pencils down, and then go create and bring to market. And so for, <laughs> for you, Prisco, what's that been like? Um, I think 
the challenge in designing for you know zero to one uh, really lies in understanding who you are launching for first and getting really crystal clear about your ICP. So this is the target audience that we want to go to and then don't allow anything else to distract you from that. I mean, there may be you know other opportunities that come up that are really attractive, but then you have to think about if this is the right time. Um, so getting that right and I think staying focused uh, is, is, is really important. And it's so hard to stay focused because everything looks like a, a possible nugget, a possible diamond and it's this philosophy of there's outward thinking, parallel thinking, and convergent thinking, and keeping the convergent thinking going rather than we're just going to add more stuff to the list and hope that if we add enough to it, the customer will actually finally give in and buy it. In fact, it's the opposite. It's the most simple, elegant experience of that problem that they want to have happen. Sometimes you'll hear in these uh, early phases, someone will say, let's find the early adopters. It's not really the early adopter as much as someone who's got so much pain that they're like, I'm dying. If I saw this yesterday, I would buy it right now. So it's finding those people that have that perspective that will just throw money at you and say, I don't care, it's not perfect. I need this solved now. And if you don't have people that are signing up for your pilot experience that have that mindset that also talk about the industry rather than just themselves, you're just solving one problem person's problem again, and you might not have this footprint of making the legacy change that you want to have happen. So it's almost as if you have to quiz them and make sure they are valid for what you're doing. Yeah, if I can just add on to that, um, I think a really good example is actually Instagram. Um, when I think they first launched, they had a bunch of different features, and uh, they made a really conscious decision to strip away all of that and just becoming a photo sharing app. And I think that's when the jackpot hit for them. Um, and I think in the same way, um, you know, the way that Apple, uh, sort of in a different vein, the way that the iPhone um, has reached really critical success is because um, there is the simplification uh, of something, of a pattern that has been around, uh, around for so long, right? Like, it's not that they necessarily come up with anything new per se, but it's the combination of existing features that work so well together uh, because they've done the due diligence to discover what what's the magic combination of uh, the features. So Priska, if you had an opening on your team right now, what would be, I guess, the the cultural criteria or the elements of a good designer that you would say, yes, he or she is the one. Like, if you were to describe that perfect candidate, and maybe it's not qualifications we're used to thinking of, but maybe it's something related to the peer-to-peer -peer, um, application that you're talking about. But if you were like, this is, what, this is what Apple's really looking for, what would that be? Um, I think this is interesting because I feel like ultimately everybody's looking for the same thing. Uh, whether it's startups or whether it's Apple, the criteria is pretty much the same. I mean, I remember when my manager told me uh, why I was hired for Apple. It's actually the same trades that startups are looking for. So basically, self-starter, uh, you're not afraid of chaos. You can make sense of the chaos, and you're able to manage stakeholders well uh, as a great communicator. And I think, um, you know, Th those are the things that, I mean, as hard as it is to believe for Apple, actually, we don't invest a lot in internal processes. So <laughs> it's really up to us to uh, take ownership of that. And um, a lot of the things that apply to startups uh, apply to Apple as well. Um, is that a good enough answer? I want to dig a little deeper into that. Yeah. Um, raise your hand if you've heard of something called the Apple way. Okay, so just a few people. The Apple way, and please weigh in on this one, um, but it's a methodology and it's approach for everything in terms of business and design and product. And it's, it's far beyond a traditional MBA 
it's almost like a recipe for success. And when you join Apple, that recipe is there and it's followed like it's a culture. I mean, you could say it's something that you read, but it's something that you breathe and something you experience. So if you could sort of talk about that from what you've seen and experienced and what maybe the Apple way is to you. Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, just a bit of context, I'm relatively new at Apple. I'm month nine, something along the lines. So uh, this is a newbie's takeaway. But um, I've been very impressed with the processes that are put in place to uh, review, for example, like the design reviews, right? Like you have to justify you know, um, every single decision that you're making in your designs. So if it's, if you can't justify it, it's, there's probably a good reason for, for it not to be there. And I, and I think um, that rigor is something that I value a lot, that um, I'm, you know, trying to keep my work um, to that same bar. Um, and I definitely think that's sort of what differentiates Apple. But... Um, in many ways, so meaning, you know, you don't launch something until, until, I mean, I don't want to use the word perfect, but until there is, until it's differentiated, let's just say. Um, and, and yeah, and, and that's, I, I think there's something to, to uh, take away from that and blend it within the startup experience, right? So it's very common uh, to hear about, you know, launch fast break things. And there's truth to that, but I think there's also a truth to balancing the quality as you're launching fast and breaking things. Without causing too many fires, right? Right. <laughs> Sometimes it's unavoidable, but you know. Uh, yeah, I like that. So Joe, in your world, you're, I know you're new at AspenX, but what would you be what would you be looking for uh, for new people to join your team and, and be part of Aspen X, Aspen One, and Aspen Skiing Company? Like, what is that really about if you were to boil it down? Because sometimes when you're new to some place, you can say, ah, it's not that. It really should be this. Like, what is that vision piece that you're looking for in the next people to join? Yeah, it's a great question, which I'm ill prepared for. Um, Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, I think, you know, what I think we're specifically going to be looking at for Aspen X as it pertains to Aspen X is this like endless curiosity. And that's been something that I've looked for in members of my team for as long as I've had them, which is like, yeah, but why? Yeah, but in a respectful way, everybody we work with, like I pride my team on deeper, 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 like what? But why did that go there? And why did we do this thing on this product? Because ultimately, in marketing, we're the last touch before consumers see it. Um, so that curiosity in asking people we work with, asking ourselves why we're doing what we're doing, um, asking, you know, why can't we be this big in this many years? And what would it take to get there? Um, this is my first experience in a startup, uh, startup arm of a well-established company, brand, et cetera. But it is a really cool, cool opportunity because the company views Aspen X as an incubator for new ideas. This is like, why would a ski company start an apparel company? I'm still figuring that out. Um, but I think it's a really cool opportunity. The other thing I would say is, um, just the unique ability to consistently execute um, throughout the ranks of the organization. Execution, in my perspective, is like the number one quality you can have as an employee. Um, thinking about people that you can count on to get stuff done. Whether it is the last slide of a deck or changing, I mean, literally anything from the highest level, but to be quite honest, like more importantly to the lowest level. Um, you can be you can be counted on to do the thing um, because if you can create a, a space where that is consistent throughout the entire team, it's a well-oiled machine. But if seventy-five percent of the people are executing and twenty-five aren't, it's a problem. 
right? It's a problem for the product, but it's also a problem for team morale. And it shows itself really, really quickly. So those are the two things I'm looking for. We're looking for, I suppose. And I'm curious question for, for the panel here in terms of pre-2020, we had this butts and seats model of everyone sitting there, they're coding, they're designing, they're developing, they're getting ready. Now that we're in this new environment, like how do you actually measure those characteristics of the people that you need on the team that they're not just gonna clock in and clock out and you know just move the keys around to show like they're doing something, but how do you actually look for that now and know that you've got that person that's gonna basically just go to the wall for you all the time? Can you clarify what actually happened in 2020? <laughs> <laughs> I will take this one first and then I'll pass it and I'll be really short. Um, I would say as a remote employee that has a team that's on site up in the mountains, it's like a 26 minute flight. I take it often. Um, I think there's a balance there because I'm the one that nobody's watching because I'm at my house. Um, so I think that's a really weird dynamic in itself. Um, but I think when we talk about, I've never been somebody that looks at clocks we were talking about it earlier today, like you're not gonna gain any points if you're working on a Friday at 7.30 p.m. That was taught to me very early in my career. I thought I was getting a heads up on everybody else. I used to work at Target Corporation. Really cutthroat stuff up there in Minneapolis. But I was sending emails on Saturdays and Sundays and I, I was 22, 23 years old. And I had a boss that said, hey, if you think I'm impressed by a Saturday email, like you, you could not be more incorrect. What it proves to me is that you can't manage your time and you might not have a social life, which is concerning on a different level. <laughs> <laughs> so I adopted that really early in my career. So if you're, if you're someone that I work with and I get an email from you at 11.30 at night, I probably ask you, are you okay? Is everything okay? Um, Ultimately, when I think about our people, you know, working 15 hours a week, I can tell without being there, just in terms of work moving across the desk. It's pretty easy to see that. Um, you don't need to be in the same room, see how many cups of coffee they're drinking or anything like that. So I think uh, that's, that's really the key. The output for that is just like, are you executing work? If so, you can be working 25 hours a week. I don't care. Um, but as long as you're executing what you're being asked to do, you're good to go in my book. Um, I would have to agree with Joe. I'm not much of a clock watcher myself either. And I think the best people, are, I mean, especially post-pandemic, um, the online communication, I think, becomes much more important. So being proactive about reaching out and uh, just saying, hey, this is what was done today. Is there anything else I can do for you? Um, that proactiveness um, really helps put people on the team at ease, I would say. Um, and yeah, and I think if you're proactive in reaching out, asking for questions, saying what you've done, um, I think for most teams that that should be fine. Yeah, I mean, you you can tell if somebody's not not doing anything. Um, I think back to your previous question, I think when you're looking for team members, you're looking for people who can get anything done, like you're saying, but also are then asking when they don't have enough because that's going to happen. You're going to have members in your team who are like, hey, I don't I don't know what my next step is or I'm not aware of this next step. And then when you get those team members, you want them, you want to spend time kind of coaching them up to be like, okay, you don't know what the next step is, propose a next step. So we can have a conversation about that because we want to get them thinking a little bit more strategic and move them into those conversations. Um, but yeah, don't really watch clock. I tell my team, turn Slack notifications off on your phone. That's your device. I shouldn't be messaging you on your phone anyways. Uh, and also don't talk to me on the weekends because I'm not going to message you back until Monday morning. So, um, but yeah. So for you, Billy, what are you looking for in a, in a designer? Like what's really important? I think, you know, 
somebody who can really do anything or is willing to do anything. Like somebody who doesn't say, well, that's, you know, I'm a UX designer, so I'm not going to um, provide concept mocks for this product. Like we wouldn't, we wouldn't want to hire somebody like that. We want somebody who's like, hey, I've never done it before. I'm going to go ahead and take a crack at it. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. We can, we'll guide you along that way. Um, but like folks who, who care a lot more than just their craft, like just design specifically, is that their one box? Like they care about, hey, why are we doing this? Who is it for? Uh, you know, if we're working with uh, founders and startups, like what is their, what have they done in the past? What are their business metrics? What are KPIs? What are those things that they care about a lot? Uh, they care for their developers because there's nothing worse than designing something and then the developer version comes out and it doesn't look like what you designed. So they're proactively having those conversations with, with teams. Uh, we don't care a lot, uh, or I don't care a lot about like hard tools, skills, because tools are flippant. We're in Figma now, we'll be in who knows what in a year, you know? So Figma skills come and go, uh, you know, we'll be in the whatever the next thing is. But folks who are like eager to learn, willing to try things out, will do the research if they don't know how to do something. Like, hey, I've never done a competitive market analysis before. So, but this is what I read. Are these the right things I should be doing? I'll have that conversation. Yep, all right, let's go ahead and do that. So really folks who can get stuff done. You just walked into something that was the next question. I don't know how you read that, but it's design systems. Like you were touching on that a little bit. Like what is the significance of that and when do you even need it? Because it, it sounds like it's core to the process, but um, it was something very new for me to think about um, as, a, as a product manager over the years. And they can make or break like what actually gets out and what gets done well. Yeah. In... In my mind, design systems are the, in five years, everyone's gonna have one. It's gonna, there will be no company that doesn't have one. They're just gonna be the thing that they, that we have. Uh, Cause they help automate so much low level thinking. So my background, I originally was in the game industry for a while. Um, and a lot of the work there was very systematized, very prefabricated is what they call it in their prefabs. Uh, so there was design systems for video games a long time before like levels are built modularly. We're not placing every brick everywhere. We've got a system for that that does that. And so when I first moved into product design, not having those capabilities, I was like baffled. I was like, wait, you guys are cutting edge. What's happening? Uh, and so now that we have those and they're becoming more well-known, I mean, within the last 10 years, I think there's a lot of conversation about them. I think in the next five years, there's just going to be a no-brainer. Everyone's going to have them. We're going to be up and running on, on, every, on every project. But they, that's one of those things that helps elevate um, designers out of those low-level conversations. We don't need to talk about things because we've made a decision at a system level so we can have more strategic conversations. We can work with marketing on the go-to-market strategy. We can work with product on new feature development and things like that. We don't have to be having um, sort of like, oh, can you mock this up again because I'm not sure how this works. I love that, Billy. So, Joe, um, as we think about the topic of design resilience, and having designers and product leaders be at the table to making to make critical decisions like how do you recommend someone get to that table because if they see it they feel it they understand it but they know it's it's not being heard how can that best be brought to the table so that you don't have that product that launches and it's it's a dud yeah i i that's a really interesting question um I think what, what's most beneficial is you always start with the end in mind. You've got agreed upon terms and conditions with ownership or leadership or whoever the boss is um, to make sure that all the work being done is out to solve a business issue or opportunity or uh, you know area of, of that, that one could capitalize on. So there's that, there's that uh, agreement up front that I'm going to go cut my team loose for seven months on a project. Let's make sure this works. Let's make sure this is going to be there in seven months. It's not, it's not, this fix is not going to be available tomorrow. It's going to take us a while. Um, 
And I think, you know, getting into that conversation, right? Like designers at the boardroom and marketers, even marketers in the boardroom, I think just being able to, um, being able to illustrate the financial change that can be driven by some of these, I mean, desi design, right? Like the, the word design as a, as a whole has changed so much in the last 15, 20 years that I think the, the, the door, that's a beautiful conference room over there, by the way. I sat in it by myself for a few minutes. We can all go into that room now in 2023. And I don't know, I probably, I don't know. I haven't been in the workforce that long, but I think there was a day not so long ago where like designers and marketers, this is where the adults sit, right? And I think given the technology we're working with, given the solutions we're coming up with, we do have seats in that room. We just have to use them very responsibly. I love that. I actually remember working at a company where you, once you were working in that room, if you saw someone else come by that was another level from you or a higher performing department in terms of those are, those are the folks that really make a difference, you had to leave that room and you just sort of got a stare and you just knew you had like three seconds to get out. <laughs> Priska, in your view, how, how do designers today actually get to that table and, and show that they're worthy, but not in the way that you're trying to sell it. They just go, I wanna hear what you have to say. Like, this is important, let's pause everything. Your voice matters. Like, how can that happen? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think a lot of what uh, both Joe and Billy has covered kind of answers this question, but I think it's a matter of really understanding the business that you're in as a designer and really understand the challenges that you're trying to solve, the problems you're trying to solve, the metrics that you're trying to hit and be a good listener and, and then come up with something and present it to them. You know, hey, I've really thought about your problems deeply and I understand them and here is how I propose to help you solve these problems. And I think when you, when you go in showing that, you know, you really understand the business, you know uh, what they're trying to accomplish, then there is an implicit trust that is handed to you from stakeholders. Uh, and, and, and then you are given carte blanche, basically, to do what you need to do. And that's how you earn a seat at the table, is showing them that, hey, I'm not just somebody who delivers mocks and uh, do feature updates. Like, I actually really understand uh, how my role can help you in your business. Now I'd like to open it up to the audience to ask questions. Um, if you've got a question, just raise your hand. Yes. Um, how did Prada happen? It's the same question I asked when I got there. Um, the Aspen One is owned by a family, um, and there was a relationship there with Prada. That's how that one happened. Um, what do we have coming up? Oh, there's so many that I can't talk about, but one that I can is a collaboration coming in November with a brand out of California called Ether. A-E-T-H-E-R. Um, we're gonna go up to Aspen and shoot that in two weeks. Super exciting. Um, we also have a collaboration this winter coming with Anon Sco Goggles, Ski Goggles, yeah. Um, and then there's many more cooking, but that's what's in the hopper right now, yep. Great, who else has a question? Way over in the back. Yes. Okay. Uh, for Priska, um, you mentioned having to um, justify every design decision. What is the what are the processes and criteria for justifying um, each of those design decisions? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Are you specifically referring to the Apple process, or yeah? So 
um, along the same lines, it's like, you know, does this solve a business problem? Is this interaction really needed? Can we, how can we simplify this? I think the question is always, how can we simplify this to achieve what we're trying to achieve? Yeah. So one of the things that I'm gonna do now from change up from the beginning, as I said, there was one word I wasn't gonna say. Well, that time is over. I'm gonna say that one word, but it's, it's for your benefit. Um, Billy put together a bunch of resources for design, design leadership, anyone that's trying to think about how do I go from this inspiration to something that's down on paper that when it's created, others can look at it and go, wow. So this, these are free resources that we put together for you. So um, if you've got your phone, pull that out. This is something that you're either gonna want for yourself or someone that's a peer of yours, that's a designer that's like, I'm just looking for a way to do things quickly and well. We will be here afterwards as well to um, meet with anyone that wants to go deeper on this for tomorrow morning. We're doing something called Design and Donuts. Now, if you're um, gluten-free, free-range, 10,000 acre, you don't want donuts, that's okay. Um, but it sounded good from a marketing perspective. <laughs> we, we'd love to see you there tomorrow. Um, it's, it's informal, it's fun, there's coffee there, and it's just a chance to build more relations and just have conversations that are meaningful to you. This is not about us. This is not about Headway. This is not about Apple. This is not about AspenX. Everything we did today was for you. And I hope it was helpful. And um, if you do want to just reach out to me after your mind stops exploding from everything that you've learned and seen this week, happy to have a conversation with you. At the end of the day, again, it's about you, and if, if I or anyone up here can be helpful to you, that's what we want to do. We want to serve others. So I'd like to open it up for a couple more questions. I saw other hands. Yes? Uh, I, thank you for, uh, for the talk. Uh, being a founder myself, and my co-founder was actually a designer. I'm a technologist. We had a lot of challenges in communicating because the design language is very different from like a technical language. So I was wondering if you could tell us about like your strategies to communicate with people who have a very different background compared to yours. Yeah, so depending on, on the project and, and who we're working with on the team, um, it shows up in, in different ways. Uh, early on, one thing that we did is we told all our developers we're not redlining anything anymore. Uh, we're gonna go into Figma and we're gonna show them how to essentially teach Amanda Fish. We're gonna show you how to get all this information for yourself um, so that we can just give the actual relevant documentation and the things that they need to understand um, to, to make sure that they build everything you know, the, quickly, because that's what they need to do. They're under tight deadlines. Um, and we talk early on with development ahead of time, so they don't, there's no surprises. You know, we're like, hey, here's the ideas we're proposing. Here's a rough sketch, napkin sketch, a doodle. This is what I'm thinking about doing. How feasible is this? Is this gonna be challenging? Uh, we worked on a big product where we initially were like, oh, everything needs to be drag and drop. And the development team was like, oh, we, can't do, we can't do that. We've got three weeks to deliver all this stuff. There's no way we're doing drag and drop. Uh, but that was a conversation we were able to have early on with our dev team so that we can make sure we can find those happy mediums. Um, and our dev team constantly does things to level us up as well. Like, hey, these are understanding the frameworks we're using, why we're choosing these things, what are easy out of the box type things. Um, hey, we're using this new charting tool. Here are the charts that you have available. If you want to design anything special, that's gotta be a special request, things like that. Um, it really comes down to communication and spending that time together um, and really trying to understand each other's perspective. Like, there's no developer out there who's like not going to dev your design because they don't like it. And there's no designer who's like purposely trying to make a developer's life hard. They're both trying to do the best thing possible. Um, they just gotta spend a lot more time talking to each other and trying to understand each other's worlds. Um, yeah, so it sounds like it would be, it may be a fruitful exercise for you guys to both sit down and discuss what, I, I guess, like your vision for what you're trying to build is. And then there's some certain principles that you can't compromise, and what are those? And so be really clear about those up front. And then 
whatever that it is that you're trying to do needs to map back to those principles. So if anything that you're trying to build does not hit those principles, then maybe it's not a good idea to follow through. So I want to thank Billy and Prisca and Joe for being here today for all of you. Thank you guys. <laughs>